let me start here. A couple of weeks ago, we started this new mini-series uh, within our larger series over the book of John. We called it simply Seven Signs, and it will carry us through to Resurrection Sunday on April 9th. And throughout this mini-series, we will continue to look at many miracles and, or signs that Jesus performed, and we'll hear stories of this divine intervention through the power of God pointing to Jesus' divinity. Now, John doesn't intend to offer a complete listing of all the many signs and wonders that Jesus did. In fact, he states just the opposite in a text that Frank has used throughout this series over the book of John to illustrate the breadth and the depth of Jesus' ministry while he was here on earth. John 20, verses 30 through 31 says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He states that that's what these signs are for, to make sure you understood that Jesus is in fact the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Today's sign, we encounter a fascinating story that happened at the pool of Bethesda. A man who had been lame for 38 years was lying there when Jesus came upon him. And when he does, he asks, asks this man, who's an invalid, a seemingly obvious question. He says, do you want to be healed? And the man, in response to Jesus, offers excuses. Excuses to why he has not been healed. And while his response is puzzling, it's not unlike what happens to many of us when we tend to grow comfortable in difficult circumstances. Maybe we're not in a case where we're, we're stuck without the ability to walk, but we face difficult circumstances or problems in our life. Whether it's a painful relationship, a problem that we might face in our finances or in our spiritual walk, we sometimes will feel that the effort or personal investment needed to change that circumstance is so much greater than simply dealing with it and accepting it. And it isn't that we find, find contentment in this. It's not that we are content with this circumstance. Instead, it's a hopeless resignation that nothing's truly going to change in this relationship or with this problem of sin that we're dealing with or a, a difficulty that we're facing in life. Nothing will truly change about the circumstance, including our attitudes. And the sobering truth is that many times it isn't actually our circumstances that have to change to resolve the issue or the problem. It's us. We have to change. And that, my friends, can be so much more difficult to accept and embrace as we go about seeking to determine who is to blame for the problems we face. Who is to blame for the strain in the relationship that we have? Who is to blame for the hurts that we are currently enduring? Who is to blame for the losses that we suffer? It leads us to understand in our big idea of this. First, that God may not change your circumstances. You may face something, you may pray about it consistently, just like Paul said, I prayed about the removal of this thorn in the flesh, whatever it might have been, many times, three times. And the Lord kept saying, my grace is sufficient for you. There are times that you're going to pray about this, but God may not always change your circumstances in life. But he always, he always wants to change you in the midst of it. Paul understood this. He wrote to the Philippians in uh, chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, I know how to be brought low, and I know, how to be, uh, I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You see, Paul had learned the, the, the truth. What contentment is, is not just simply accepting that, oh, things are always going to be this way. I guess I can't deal with it. It's that he had accepted and understood that no matter what he was going through, God gave him the strength to endure it, and God was leading him through that. He gave him the strength to do what God needed Paul to do, what he was called to do. He's not advocating indifference or apathy about circumstances of life. Instead, he is preaching this attitude of contentment, understanding that nothing separates us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And because of that, he equips us with everything we need to endure and actually thrive in this life, whatever the circumstances might be, whatever we're dealing with today. And as we become open to this concept, 
we will focus more on change that we might need in our life, our walk of faith, and less on changes that we desire in our circumstance to make things better. When this happens, I know this truth. God will stretch your faith like it's never been stretched before. When you can accept that the circumstances of, of life are not something that shocks God, and whatever you're dealing with, God knows about it. It'll stretch your faith. It'll fill you with more hope than you've ever had before. And you will begin to trust him more than you've ever trusted him before, regardless of what he has done or what he does not do. Because he is worthy of our trust. I don't know how many times I've looked back in my life in times that I've gone through difficulties. Whatever that strain was, whatever that, that challenge was that I thought, God, why, are you, why isn't this ending? I'm tired of this. I'm tired of, of whatever it is. And now I look back years later and I see how my faith grew from that. Or I see the blessings that God has brought upon me because I went through that. So today as we look at this story from John chapter 5, we're going to look at three aspects of this story. And they're easy to remember. Like always, I give you an alliteration to remember. And it's the pool, the problem, and the possibility. I want to look first at this pool. What was the pool of Bethesda? Well, for, for us today, it's the harbinger that we seek. And many of you are going, oh, What's a harbinger? Maybe you, if you know what a harbinger is, I didn't know what it was until I got to high school. And the only reason I knew what it was in high school, it's what our, our school newsletter was called. Our school newsletter in high school was the harbinger. So I always thought for many years, harbinger just meant a periodical. I was wrong. That's not what it means. It's, it's a herald or a sign of things to come. And that's what this pool was for the man that we'll talk about today and the people that were around it. Look at John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man had, was there who had an infirmity 38 years. Now the historical context of this is the pool of Bethesda is, a, is an interesting place. We learned that in this passage that this pool was near the sheep gate. In Jerusalem, and was divided into two parts. Half of it, the pool, was used to clean sheep. The other one was for human consumption and, and, and use. Needless to say, if they were cleaning sheep in it, you wouldn't want to drink out of that one, I don't believe. But there were two sides of that pool, and there were these porches, these colonnades that were around it. The divider of one of these went right down the middle of the pool. The Bible says there was a multitude of invalids there waiting and watching for a miracle that would come. John tells us that people waited for the moving of the water, believing an angel of God would stir the water, and whoever was first into the water would be healed of their infirmity. Many commentators believe that John wasn't trying to necessarily, you know, communicate that it was actually a happening, but rather to convey a first century superstition about the pool. Don't know. It could have been one of those things that became a legend. And as that legend grew, people would come down and, and, and they would try to get close, hoping against hope that when that water stirred, they could be the first one in. For the skeptics in the 18th and 19th century, when historical scholarship was beginning to develop, especially around the, the scriptures, many historians argued that the Bible was filled with many inaccuracies. This pool of Bethesda was widely used by these historians as a proof of biblical inaccuracy and, and, and errors because there was no other record in the, in the time of, of, this, of the writing here, there was no, no other record of a pool with five porches in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate. Years later, though, in the 60s, though, archaeologists dug up the pool and it was under a church that had been built on top of its location to market the location, even though the significance had fallen by the wayside. And they discovered that the pool did indeed have two basins with four porches on the exterior and one porch down the middle. That really doesn't share anything in our message today to help us understand something, but what it does is it gives us a foundation that if we cannot trust the historical accuracy and authority of the Bible, it's much more difficult to trust the spiritual accuracy and authority of the Bible. 
As we talk about all of these miraculous signs and wonders that Jesus performed, remember these are not fables or fictions or parables that Jesus is telling or that Jesus is recounting. These are actual events that took place in human history. But in this case, the problem for so many of those people, including our main character here, was that they came waiting and watching for a miracle to come. Whether it was true or not, they were willing to come and wait because it was a harbinger, a herald, a sign that healing could come into their lives. Their methodology may have varied from one person to next about how they would get it. Some prepared, I'm sure, to do like a cannonball into the water. Others decided to slip silently into it. I don't know. But the limited options were just the same. In the legend or the superstition or the truth, whatever it might have been, the truth was shared that the first person who got to the water would be healed of whatever their infirmity was. And in a sense, even though we don't deal with that today, it doesn't differ from the ways that we seek to change our circumstances today. The main three ways that I think they were trying to change and that we try first is with dogged determination. We just show up. I come every day. I keep showing up and something good eventually is going to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to turn this thing around if I, just, if I can just show up. Unfortunately, many times this ultimately leads to despair when the promised good never actually comes or our expectation of what is good changes. Like Sisyphus from Greek mythology, we feel condemned to forever push a stone up the hill without ever reaching the top and being done. Dogged determination is a way that we try to change our circumstances. Show up. Eventually something good will happen, but it doesn't always work that way. Their second thing would be fortuitous fate. I would subtitle this one, baby needs a new pair of shoes. We want to pull that arm on the slot machine. We want to throw those dice and hope that they finally come up the way that we want. If my luck would just change in this life, perhaps my life might change too. If I could just win the lottery, I can solve all my financial problems. The harsh reality is that few people win the lottery and the house always seems to win at Vegas because that's the way it's set. We can't hope for luck when it comes to changing our circumstances. A third way is religious repetition. If I just try harder, learn from my mistakes, eventually I'll be good enough. Like Bill Murray's character from the movie Groundhog Day, and if you've not seen that movie, it's basically the story of a man who wakes up one day, lives through the day, and then the next day wakes up and has to live it all over again, exactly the same, over and over and over for many years. And in his efforts, he, he begins to, to recognize the opportunity to better himself. And so each day he tries to make it more perfect, to make his life more meaningful so that he can move to the next day. And like that character, I think sometimes we assume that the issue is that we need to try slowly to become a better and better person and then our circumstances can truly change. To walk a straighter line until I find the success that I want. If I can just do better today than I did yesterday, I might w make it to where I need to be and where I want to be in this life. In simple form, none of these are essentially bad. There's nothing wrong with living a life with determination. There's nothing wrong with enjoying surprise blessings that come into our life. There's nothing wrong with seeking to be a better person spiritually every day. The problem is assuming that those things will truly bring about external changes to our circumstances, thus leading to contentment. That only comes through Christ. Because that's the funny thing about contentment. If it takes a change in our circumstances to, to find contentment, we're just going to need more changes. If a certain car is what you need to find contentment, when you get it, you're going to want a better car. If your relationship is struggling and you're trying to build that relationship back and you think that working harder over and over is going to eventually get it, you're going to be disappointed because there's going to be more pitfalls in those relationships. Paul wrote to the Ephesian church in chapter 2, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of your own duty, doing, it's a gift of God, 
not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God prepared us for good works. He doesn't wait for us to do good works to change our circumstance. We have been saved, not because of how hard we've worked, not because of sheer luck, and not because of religious repetition. We have been saved according to Paul and through Jesus Christ, the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We have been saved by grace, not because of what we have done. Our salvation, what we truly need from God, is not the result of sheer luck, willpower, or dedication to strict training. It comes only in the gift of grace. That's why we know we can serve Him and follow Him. That's why we can be content no matter what the circumstances are. Second thing, the problem. We looked at the pool. It was a harbinger of what we seek. The problem is it's the help we want. It's that help that we want in life. John tells us that the multitude of people gathered around the pool had something in common. They were all waiting and watching for this miraculous healing. Our main character has been waiting and watching and hoping and looking for help for 38 years. Now, I, that's not to say that he laid by the pool for 38 years. Uh, that, that this has been an ongoing thing, daily coming down to the pool for 38 years. But we assume from the way Jesus addresses it later and what we know that it's been a long time. He's been in this condition for 38 years. My question is for you today to consider how long have you been waiting for your circumstances to change? Whatever that circumstance is, that thing that you've longed for in your life to change. Have you ever noticed how people love to find others who have the same problems as they do? It's in its sense not wrong. It's why Alcoholics Anonymous and, and addictions, uh, addicts, addicts, addictions Anonymous, Addicts Anonymous. It's why so many of those work so well because people share their, their burdens and share a journey together. In this story, the phrase misery love company uh, comes to mind. But whether it's infirmity, rejection, offense, or some other relational wound or emotional trauma, people love to gather around those with common problems. Here's the problem. Here's the real issue. That sometimes there's not a desire to actually solve or overcome the problem. People just want to have sympathetic, ear, sympathetic ears that they can complain to, hoping that some event might change their circumstances. And most of the time, as we've talked about, it's not our circumstances that need to change. It's our hearts, our minds, and our desires that need to be changed. But I do realize that there are times people would rather be affirmed than challenged. It turns out it's much easier to play the role of a victim than to, and garner sympathy from others to make an inward change that might actually encourage us and, and perhaps might encourage someone else as well. Finding someone to blame for what's going on in their lives takes much less effort than accepting the personal responsibility of truly seeking what change God might have for us, how we might learn to be content. It's interesting to look, what does Jesus not do in this story? I mean, we can read ahead and we will, but we know what he does, but what does he not do? Well, the first thing he does is not look at the man and say, hey, listen, I am so sorry that your life has been so hard. I know it's been rough, and you've been in misery for a long time. This must be awful for you. It's horrible that you have to deal with this. What does Jesus do then, in fact? Verse 6 says, When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? <laughs> On the surface, the question seems at best to be insensitive, and at worst, it sounds like he's cruelly mocking this man's condition. I mean, you see someone who's hurting, someone who's laying on the ground and can't walk, and you look at him and say, would you like to be healed? <laughs> well, of course he does. But it's not hard to imagine in our culture today how quickly Jesus would have been canceled for this question. Consider how modern responses to Jesus' words would have looked. Someone posts on, on Twitter, seeing this story, says, Jesus refuses to affirm this man's suffering and acknowledge his hardship in truth. Jesus completely ignores hundreds of suffering people to, to focus on this one guy. Jesus refuses to either share in the misery of hashtag poolside paralytic 
or to start a GoFundMe account to help him out. Jesus callously asks a disadvantaged man if he wants to be healed instead of validating his victim status, condemning the society that has made him this way. Of course, we know why that is. It's not because Jesus was discompassionate. It's not that Jesus didn't care. We recognize the love of Christ because of all that he has done for us. But instead, don't miss this truth. I don't even have this on our notes anywhere, but if you want to write this down, don't miss this above anything else. Jesus is not in the business of changing circumstances. He's in the business of changing people. That's not that he didn't feed 5,000, he didn't heal people, he didn't show compassion, but he was more about changing people than changing their circumstance because God is more concerned about where you end up after this life than how comfortable and happy you are in this life. I know it may seem inconsistent when we look and see Jesus offered to heal this man, right? Oh, wait. He didn't offer to heal this man, did he? He asked him if he wanted to be healed. Jesus made no offer because Jesus was looking to change this man's life. Verse 7, Sir, his response, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Look at how he responds to Jesus. Jesus doesn't invite him to be healed. He asks if he wants to be healed, and he immediately offers excuses as to why he can't be healed because he sees one path to healing. Instead of saying, yes, I'd like that very much, it seems obvious that he did not realize who he was talking to. He didn't call him the typical names that people that knew Jesus he calls him sir. He doesn't call him rabbi or teacher or Lord. You see, he wasn't looking for Jesus. He was looking for help to get down into the water. He wasn't pursuing Jesus, but right now, folks, I want you to understand, Jesus came to that place pursuing him. Jesus had to bypass a lot of people for this one man who was oblivious to who Jesus was. There's a truth there that we can't, we can't pursue right now. We don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but there's always a multitude, but Jesus always finds the one. Even in a multitude, Jesus finds the one that needs his help. So let's, play, let's make a deal with Monty Hall. <laughs> because this guy's got a choice. We have a choice when we deal with difficult circumstances. When we read scriptures that find a calling from God to say, this is what you should do. This is how you should live. Behind door number one, we see make an excuse to rationalize indifference. In answering Jesus, the sick man offers two primary complaints and excuses. He says, I have no man to put me in the pool, and another steps down before me. In short, he's saying, I don't have anybody to help, and I don't have the resources to get there myself. Again, none of us that I know of, you may lay around a pool at your house, but I'm guessing it's not so that you can be the first one to fall in and, and cure your financial woes. But what does it sound like for us today? Jesus says, do you want to be made well? Do you want things to be right? And we say, I believe God heals marriages, but let me tell you why that won't work for me. I believe God can deliver people from addiction, but you have to understand my situation is different. I know that God did that for you, but I am the exception to his power. My life would be so much better if this, whatever it is, didn't happen to me. If someone hadn't betrayed me, if someone hadn't hurt me, if that person hadn't abused me, if this person hadn't failed me, things would be better. My circumstances, my life would be so much better. <laughs> it reminds me of Moses. Now, here's a guy that was on top of the world. He was, he was an adopted son of Pharaoh. He had everything he could want. But in his anger, he, he killed a man that was abusing a, a slave, one of his, his people. He flees, runs away, and hides out in the desert for 40 years. He went from being a prince of Pharaoh to being a guy that walked around looking for patches of grass to feed sheep. And God comes to him and says, I have good news for you, Moses. I've heard my people's cry, and you are going to deliver my people. You see, the mistake Moses made was that he thought that God was giving him a job 
that he was equipped for, and so Moses wanted him to understand that he wasn't. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, so give me a little leeway. Moses said, I'm a nobody. God said, I know, but I'm going to be with you. Moses said, they're not going to believe me when I come to them. And God said, probably not, but they're going to believe me when they see my signs and wonders. God, I, I get tongue-tied. God said, hey, did you know I created the tongue? I make it work. Moses said, please, just send someone else. God said, good news, I will. Your brother Aaron's going to go, but you're still going. <laughs> what do you have in your life right now that you're making excuses about? Maybe it's that relationship, like I say, that needs to be repaired. Maybe your finances are in disarray. Maybe you're hurting and people don't know about it. Have you decided this morning that you're the exception to God's plan? Nobody knows the depression you're facing. Nobody understands the hurt. Have you decided that God doesn't have a purpose or plan for you? Because he does. Do you have questions about God's care and compassion? Read the scriptures and see what he does for his people. Regardless of what you might tell yourself, you are not the exception. But you are the only person in this world that can hinder God's plan for your life. You're the only one. Behind door number two, we see a different response. Make the effort to restore the expectation of God's blessing in your life. Sometimes God's power shows up in a moment. Sometimes it takes a little longer. But God always leads his people where they need to be. Jesus says to this man after hearing the excuses, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Interesting side note, we'll come back to this. Those are three things that he hadn't been able to do for 38 years. Not a one of them. Jesus moves right past this man's excuses. He doesn't even acknowledge them. He doesn't say, oh, yeah, I got what you're saying. Yeah, that's tough. He goes straight to the solution, and in the process, he asks the man to participate. He doesn't say, wave his hand and say, okay, you're healed. He says, get up, take your bed, and walk out of here. Number one, because you're not going to need that bed in here anymore. He asked the man to participate. You see, many of us get comfortable with the challenges and difficulties we face, and we don't want to be putting in the effort sometimes to make things better. We, we've become comfortable. We've learned to deal with the challenges. And as I said earlier, often the, the pain of recovery is worse than the pain of the thing that got us into that place in the first place. The pain of changing is harder and takes longer than just simply going through it. So many people choose to stay victims because they become comfortable in their pain. pain excuse me. That's why Jesus asked the sick man, do you want to be healed? The question is not, do you want your circumstances to be changed? He doesn't say, you want me to, you know, uh, help you get closer to the pool? You want me to come back every day? You, I'll put you right on the side and I'll watch. And if those waters move, I'll shove you right in. He doesn't say that. He says, do you want to be changed? Because if he doesn't want to change, his circumstances won't matter. Take up your bed and walk. Be changed. Be made whole. You have to make a decision that the, the, the creator of the universe is standing before you and saying, make this change. And you can say, I can't, I can't. I've, I, I've, not, I've not done this for 38 years. But you have to put in the effort. As Paul would write the Thessalonians, rejoice always, not just when things are going your way. Pray without ceasing, not just when you need God's help and you're in the foxhole of life. Give thanks in all circumstances, good, bad, ugly. Still giving thanks because God is there and hasn't left you. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Leads us to our third point today, the possibility. The, 
pool might be a harbinger we seek in this life, a special move from, from our circumstances. The, pool, the problem might exist where we say, I just need somebody to help. But the possibility is the hope that we need. John chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Again, Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And I love this. 38 minutes later, the man was healed. No, at once, the man was healed. And what did he do? He took up his bed and walked, because that's what he'd been told, that's what he'd been given a command to do. The thing you've been laying on for 38 years, I want you to pick it up. It really comes down to a choice. We can reject the command and the directions and say no and be done with it. I choose to wallow in self-pity. I, I choose to feel sorry for myself and to complain that life is so unfair. You're telling me to stand up at a time. I've never been able to stand up for years, and now you're saying stand up. I can't do that. Again, I don't have any special insight to this. But my guess is if for whatever reason the man chose to rise up, that's when his legs were strengthened. That's, that's, that's the gospel according to Dave, so don't, don't quote me on that. That if he had just laid there and said, but I can't, you know what? That would have been the truth. He would have still been laying there. It's when he heard those words and whatever authority that Jesus spoke with somehow made him think, I should. And so he rises up, takes his bed and walks. We can continue to complain in this life, make an excuse for why we can't or shouldn't change anything. People just don't understand what we're dealing with or how difficult it is for us. Yeah, we can keep complaining about that. We can find people that will listen to us. I guarantee you in this world in which we live, if you want to complain about stuff, you will find somebody that will be sympathetic to you and tell you, you're right, everyone is out to get you. Your teachers your co-workers, your boss, your friends, your neighbors. They're all out to get us. Or we can accept that he wouldn't give us a command. He wouldn't call us to something that he didn't, know, didn't already know that we could do. Not on our own, but through him as he directs us. You see, that was the point. That guy laid there for however many years, hoping for a chance to get into that water. But when he heard the words of Jesus, he followed. Even though he had not had the strength in his legs to stand up, he didn't have the ability to carry a bed. He didn't have a, even the ability to walk around. But when Jesus spoke, he was empowered and got up and did that. What does it mean to us? Well, like I said, none of us are probably waiting to get into a pool to be healed. But we all have those circumstances of life we're fi fighting through and, de and dealing with. And so the, c the command that I know God gives to us through his son, Jesus Christ, let me summarize it this way. Pick it up and carry it with you in order to put the past behind you. You can't use it as an excuse anymore. You are God's child. And no matter how difficult your circumstance may be, that has not changed that truth. It's no longer a justification for you to play the part of the victim. It's no longer the thing you use to get attention or pity. Pick it up and carry it to put that past behind you. Because again, like we talked about at the beginning, you're not going to change the past. Own up to mistakes. Recognize that there are problems and difficulties that all of us face, but that God has not left us. And secondly, pick it up and carry it with you in order to testify to what I, God, has done for you. An admission of your need. An acknowledgement of his power. An affirmation of his lordship overall, even our human limitations. We started this worship today with a song based upon Psalm chapter 40. And I read those words again for you. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry uh, bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. That was written by David during, during one of his difficult times of life. And let me explain something. This psalm doesn't say exactly when this time was. Some of the psalms do indicate what the psalm was written in response to. But I can tell you this, no matter what happened before or what happened after, David did not get free of the circumstances of life. He did not 
get away from problems that this world threw at him. But what he does acknowledge is that as he waited, waited patiently for the Lord and cried out to him, God lifted him up. Didn't change his circumstance. He lifted him up, uh, gave him a steady uh, step to, uh, to walk. He says, he put a new song in my mouth. I began to praise and honor him no matter what. And he said, many see and fear and put their trust in the Lord because of that. Imagine what would happen if we lived that way through those circumstances. The impact that we could have on people. We've all seen people who, who succeed or, or achieve things in spite of their circumstances of life. And we're, we're, we're motivated by that. And yet we all have that same truth. No matter what we're going through, God can take us through that. And we can give glory and honor to Him. What might be possible in your life today if you chose to accept God? the changes God might be trying to make in your life rather than resisting or insisting on changes to your circumstances first. God, I'll give. I'll give a portion of my what you give me. I'll be faithful in giving as soon as I get out of these financial problems. Change my circumstances, God, and so I can follow you. You know, when I get that promotion at work, God, you know, I'll get to a point where, where I'll have more time for my family for my church to minister and serve others. But God, i got to change these circumstances first. If I can just get the house where I want it to be, if I can get these things done, Lord, then I'll have more time. But i got to do this and do that. You see, we keep finding circumstances that need to be changed when it's us that needs to change. Not simply for the sake of change. We're not talking about New Year's resolutions. I want to try to eat less Cheesecake this year. You know, it's, it's not that. It's a genuine change of heart. I'm asking you to consider God's Word, the teachings of Christ, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to respond in a manner that is consistent with His leading and His call. Even if it calls you to change from what you've been doing for weeks or months or even years in trying to put circumstances ahead of the changes that God wants. It leads us to our next step. You can't do anything to change the past. Can we agree on that? We can do all sorts of things to amend mistakes, but we can never change the past. It's a fixed point. Despite whatever science fiction movies you may have watched, despite you might have the ability to run like the Flash and go back in time, uh, it doesn't exist. Once it has happened, it has happened. But here's the truth. God wants to do something in you to change your future. He wants to do something in you and through you to change your future. Let's pray. God, I just thank you this day for your blessings. Lord, I pray that you would challenge us to focus less on the circumstances of our life and more on the changes that you desire to make in our lives. Most importantly, when it comes to our spiritual walk and the way that we live, we think sometimes, Lord, that if we want to be right in your eyes, we just need to get rid of this sin that we've held on to so tightly. And I'm not condoning sin any more than you are, Lord. But we will never be good enough. We will never be able to change the past and, and make up for the past mistakes we've made. But what we can do, Lord, is allow you to work through us to lead us to salvation and forgiveness, to help us to lead others in that direction, to, to have a spiritual and, and truthful, genuine impact on someone's life, not because of what we have done, but because of Christ living in us. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Maybe today Jesus is asking you, do you want to be healed? Whatever it is. Maybe you're the one looking at him while he says, take up your bed. Take up this burden that has been a part of you for so many years and walk away. Maybe you're the one who needs to stand up today and say, I'm not going to make any more excuses. I'm not going to play the victim anymore. I'm not going to let the enemy of my soul rob me of the destiny that God has for me 
to minister to others, to serve others, and to be in his presence one day in heaven. I'm going to pick up my bed, hold it high above my head, and I'm going to let the world know what God has done for me. Maybe that's you today. I want you to understand something. If you need God to deliver you from depression or anxiety, come to Jesus and lay that at his feet. If you need a miracle of salvation, let his forgiveness, come to Jesus and let his forgiveness wipe the slate clean. If you need healing, come to Jesus. I can't promise that if you've got a physical affliction that God is going to instantly heal that, but he can heal your heart and help you to work through that circumstance, whatever it might be. If you need God to meet you in the middle of your grief, come to Jesus and give him that grief. If you need the God who makes all things new to intervene in your life, come to Jesus. If you need a fresh start, come to Jesus. That's the invitation we offer. But really, it's not our invitation to offer. We offer it on behalf of God and through the grace of Jesus Christ. If you need God to break the chains of your circumstances, come to Jesus and know that he can bring such healing. We're going to sing here in a moment, and as always, we would share with you. We would never want to think that someone here doesn't need to know more about God's grace or God's forgiveness. What he requires of us through his word. So if that is something that you need, we encourage you to reach out to one of the folks that is here. We got to witness such a blessing last week and watch Ashley be buried in the waters of baptism. And again, I know Ashley a little bit. She seems like a very nice person. It would be hard for me to say, oh yeah, there's somebody that needs some forgiveness. (laughs) But I can. Because all of us have sinned. and All of us have fallen short of God's glory. All of us need the gift of eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ. We need him to break the chains of sin and circumstance that hold us from becoming what God wants us to be. Let's stand together. 